part number two of the message series we began last week entitled Heroes, where we are going back through primarily the Old Testament and looking at some of the great heroes of our faith, individuals that, that has shown us what it means to be a follower of God, to have character, to be courageous in their faith. And we are looking at that as a hope for that to be a source of inspiration and uh, encouragement for us to live with the same passion, the same uh, level of being sold out to God uh, in our world as they did in theirs. Today, for part number two, we're jumping into Hebrews chapter 11. This is known as the Hall of Faith. You guys have heard of the Hall of Fame. This is the Hall of Faith in the Bible that lists off several of the faithful leaders and people that exhibited great faith throughout the Old Testament and even the New Testament. And this portion of Scripture, beginning in verse 8, is talking about Abraham and Sarah. It says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise as a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him in the same promise. He was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many, and as, many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. And so this portion of scripture highlights what we know as Abraham, as the father of our faith. But really today, I don't want to look at the hero Abraham, although his life is incredible. I want to look at his wife and talk about Sarah, because if he is the father of our faith, that means Sarah is the mother of our faith. What does that mean? Not only do we have a great example of faith passed down to us of how we can live a life of faith, but also the holy lineage of Jesus Christ can trace all the way back to Abraham and Sarah, the Messiah here on this earth. Abraham and Sarah had Isaac, and they had Jacob, and then from Jacob came the 12 tribes of Israel, and then you fast forward 15 generations of the tribe Judah, and you get Mary, which is the mother of Jesus. And so this is a faith passed on to us, both a religion, a relationship with God, and also an example of faith. And in this journey that they went on is so significant because of the circumstances, basically in a nutshell, and again, the focus is on Sarah, but God appeared to Abraham and said to Abraham that I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you a great nation. You're going to have children, even though he was old. And, but to do that, I need to remove you from the land that you're in and bring you to the land of Cana, which is also known as the promised land. And so there's a map that they're going to put up of the route that Abraham and Sarah took. Lower right-hand side is Ur of the Chaldees, which is modern-day Iraq. And they went northwest all the way up to the top to Haran. That was about 600 miles of journey. And then they went southwest about 400 miles to what we now know as Israel. They actually technically went a little bit past it towards Egypt and back. So somewhere around the lines of 1,000 to 1,200 miles that they traveled from the land that they were in, Ur of the Chaldees, to eventually the promised land, Canaan. And then not only that, but it took them um, 25 years from the point in which God said, leave this land, I'm going to make you a great nation, it took them 25 years for them to have their first child, Isaac. So many of us were believing for God for something, we're praying, we're hoping, we're asking, and we're going, man, where is it? And maybe we've waited for years, 10 years, even more than that, and we're just waiting. Maybe it's a child that you're just praying and believing will come back to God. Whatever it is, we're waiting. They had to wait 25 years. And in those years, they traveled over 1,000 miles to position their lives, their hearts, their families to experience the blessing that was promised to them. In fact, Isaac was called the promise. 
And here's the thing, Abraham's faith was great. And that's why we talk about Abraham all the time. But I, but I think Sarah's faith was greater. And reason being is Abraham heard from God. Abraham had an encounter where he heard the audible voice of God. Sarah did not. Abraham went back to Sarah, explained what happened, and said, now it's time for us to go, to pack up everything. And so for Sarah to go only off of the words of her husband and to say, okay, I'm going to turn away from all of that stuff and I'm going to move forward in the great unknown, that takes great faith. As a side note, every, I, I, my prayer is that every single one of you here hears the voice of God. Whether it be the audible voice of God, you see visions, you have dreams, most likely it's the still small voice, the, the nudge in your heart from the Holy Spirit. Whatever it is, my prayer is that you actively desire to hear the voice of God and that you hear the voice of God. He's not hiding from you, but he does want us to desire to know him more and to hear his voice. But even if you don't hear a clear direction voice from God, we still have the word of God, which is the Bible that has been given to us. And, and, and so even if we don't have a clear, this is what you are to do, leave here, go there, do this, say this, even if that's not present in our lives, we still have the great blessing of the Bible, which is the words of God, it is the direction of God, and it's what we are called to live our lives by. So I think a lot of us can relate maybe more even to Sarah where we don't have a clear, this is step one, two, and three that's out in front of me, but I still have the prescription, the recipe, if you will, for living a godly lifestyle and pursuing a relationship with God that's found in the Bible. Sarah did not have a direct word from God Abraham did. I think many of us have to rejoice even if we don't have a clear direction from God because we still have been given a word from God, which is the Bible. This journey that they went on was far more than just miles and time, distance and years that go by. It was more than that. You got to understand that when God came and visited Abraham, his entire family was living in a polytheistic culture, which means they worshipped many gods. In fact, we know that Abraham's father, his trade was making idols. And, and as goes the father, so goes the son. And so most likely Abraham, he was involved not only in making idols, but also selling idols. Their family was not just profiting off idols. They were fully engaged in that lifestyle. And so when Jesus came, it wasn't like they were the one righteous person like Noah was, how we talked about last week. They were the one righteous person that, that God could trust. No, they, God came to someone that did not believe in him, that did not worship him, and that was 100% wrapped up in the corrupt, twisted culture of the land that they were living in. And so not only did God have to deal with that part of their heart, but he had to deal with it for the over 25 years and minister to them and heal them and correct them and mature them, refine out of them what was ungodly and bring to them what was of value. Abraham being an idol maker, chances are he made idols for every kind of God that was there, including the God of fertility. So people would come, would purchase his idols with the hope that in offering to these idols, especially the God of fertility, that they would be blessed. So if they wanted a kid, you go offer sacrifices to the God of fertility. Can you imagine how difficult that would be? You yourself wanting to have kids, not able to, and literally every single day in the shop that you run have to be faced with hopeful people coming in, purchasing idols for fertility, hoping and believing that they are going to receive a kid day after day, year after year you're reminded that you do not have a child. And bear in mind, in that day and age, technology is not what it is now. We know there's many different reasons why people don't have kids. Back then, they didn't know that stuff. And so it was just assumed that there was some sort of sin, that you've angered the gods. There is something wrong with you or what somebody has done in your past, your parents possibly, and that's why you're not having kids. And so this was a public shame that, held, that was held over their head at all times. It wasn't just, ah, we weren't able to have kids. That's difficult in and of itself. I, I have no idea what that's like. And some of you do, and my heart goes out to you. But this was 
there was a shame that was put on them because they did not have kids. And so they're full of shame. They're, they're in a heathenistic society. And yet God calls them out of it and says, I need you to pursue the promise that one day will change the entire course of human history. I, I can't imagine that conversation as a husband who just heard from God going and telling my wife, hey, I know we worship like hundreds of gods and all that kind of stuff, but the one true living God, I think, just came to me and he's telling us to sell everything, leave everybody, pack it all up and go on a promise. Oh yeah, and by the way, you're going to have a kid. And actually not just a kid, but you're going to be the mother and I'm going to be the father of nations. Bear in mind, Abraham was 75 years old at that time. And Sarah was 65 years old. That is a little past the childbearing age. Honestly, it'd probably be almost insulting to hear that. It'd almost feel like, listen, you know that that's my heart's desire, and you're going to say that a God told you this? You're going to bring that up and force me to leave everything and then dangle the biggest carrot in the world out there in front of me? I, I would imagine there may be even moments of hostility in that. But again, God promised that the descendants of Abraham and of Sarah, that they would be as far as the numbers of the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, unable to count. And so now we live, we live thousands of years later, and we see that. We see generation after generation, faith being built up, thousands upon thousands of Christians being brought into the faith journey that our forefathers went on. We see it. But actually, we read in other verses that Abraham and Sarah, they didn't get to see that. They just got to see their children and some of their grandchildren. They died without seeing that reality in their lives, and yet it's still a spiritual reality that they have experienced. It was never robbed from them. God didn't somehow miss the mark. God 100% gave to Abraham and Sarah what he promised, but they had to go through the journey first. They packed up their lives. They said goodbye to everyone they knew and loved, friends and family members, and they traveled with their herds and their tents. They did not stop at nice hotels. They did not have cars. They did not have air-conditioned RVs with the little satellites that go up and the televisions inside. By the way, if you have that, you're not a real camper. <laughs> you're fooling yourself. They didn't have any of that. They packed their lives up. And for over a 1,000-mile journey, 25 years, went and experienced some high highs and some low lows along the way. All on the way, I guarantee you, they had their moments of fear, of doubt, of, of confusion, of what in the world are we doing? We know just from other, verse, other stories and scripture, we're not going to take the time to read it. They sinned. They had doubt. They, had, they were disobedient. They did some things they should never have done. Read the account of them going to Egypt. That didn't pan out well for them. They had to go back. There were some missteps all along the way. I love that because they were real people. They weren't somehow these people that we can put up on a pedestal and go, they were perfect. The mother and father of our faith. No, they were just like you and I. Kind of along for the journey, wondering what in the world is going on and just trying to keep things together. My, uh, last week, my daughter, Christina, my oldest daughter, uh, she created a presentation on her iPad, and she wanted me to take a peek at it first. It was a presentation called The Pool Project, and it was for school where she had to do a, a, a research on was it more cost-effective to renovate the, the school pool or was it more cost-effective to uh, build a brand new one. And so a few days before it was due, she gave it to me, and she said, Dad, the, the name of it's Pool Project, and by the way, I'm just put a pause here. Uh, my daughter was supposed to bring her iPad home for my message so I could pull, the, pull it off, and uh, she completely forgot. So I love Christina. She stayed up for like an hour and a half last night and recreated the presentation to the best of her ability so that her daddy could have an illustration for his message. So I love that. That said, the numbers that she put in there are terribly inaccurate. She's, the, the project she made was accurate, but the, one, the remake of the project off her memory very inaccurate. So ignore the actual numbers. Some of you will be thrown off by how cheap it is, apparently, to build a pool. Uh, <laughs> but don't, don't be thrown off by that. But she was telling me how she has the project, and it's her and Colin and Keith, but then she said, Dad, but 
he's not really doing anything. He's not even a part of the project anymore. You know, the defender dad side of me was like, well, then take his name off. Let's not give him credit. But I, I backed off. Colin, Keith, and Christina. And we were going through, and she's sharing me about about halfway through. She goes to this slide right here on her iPad, and she's showing it to me, and it's a slide right here. And it looks somewhat normal. It starts to break down the prices. And, you know, there's some misspellings and things like that. But you start getting down to the middle where there's chemicals, and I'm noticing the way she wrote her numbers is really weird. Like, I've never seen 5, 9, period, 9, 9 before. And my, bear in mind, my daughter's very smart. I think she just got confused. To be fair, she's doing all of Keith's work too, right? <laughs> so she's doing double duty. It's okay to make a few mistakes. And so I'm reading this. I'm like, well, okay, chemicals are that. I'm pretty, and by the way, I'm pretty sure a diving board costs more than $130. So <laughs> decking, uh, I've never seen. I don't even know how to pronounce that. Is that $107 or is it $1,000? I don't know what that number is. And I'm asking him, like, just tell me what the number is. And she's trying to explain it to me. I'm like, it doesn't make any sense. And so without physically taking the iPad, I go through line by line. I say, tell me what the number is. And I just tell her what to type. One, zero, comma, seven. I just tell her what to do. I don't explain it. I just tell her. So we go in and we fix the slide. Here's the fixed slide. She goes in, rocks the presentation out, does great. I feel good as a dad because... You know, I helped her out. I fixed the situation. Before she turned it in, the day that it was due, she showed it to me one more time, and the last slide was way off. When you do a comparative study, and you're going to say something like, renovating a pool is cheaper than buying a brand new pool, you, you have to have both numbers. Well, she didn't have the brand new pool numbers. So it was just like, we think renovating a pool is the best choice because this is how much a renovated pool costs. I'm like, oh, well, that's incomplete. And I, but I, I realized, and I, felt, I actually felt really convicted as, we were getting, as she was getting ready to get out of the car. I felt convicted because days earlier, I just fixed her slides. I just told her what to do, kind of hand-fed it to her, do this. And I knew in my heart, like, man, I didn't actually help her out. She didn't learn. She just did what I told her to do. And so I took the time in the car with her to actually help her through that process. And I explained that you got to have one to compare to the other. And then when you see what they are, then you can declare a winner one over the other. And she got it. And she began to talk about it. And I knew by the way that she was talking about it that she understood what, what we were going for. And that she actually had learned something from her pool project. And I, I think that relates to us more than we probably would know. If any of us were asked, if we were polled, we would say that we want the blessing, the answer from God right now. But see, in order to get the blessing from God right now, without our lives being changed, without us being more obedient, without there being a life that's more matured, that requires God to not be a good God. See, only when I'm tired or irritated or distracted or super busy do I not actually spend the time to help my kids out? I'll just tell them how to do it or take the iPad and fix it myself when I don't want to actually invest into my child and I don't care, I just want to get them off my back, I'll do the work for them. But when I recognize that I love this child and I'm supposed to train them up, not just in the ways of God, but in the ways of, uh, of learning through all of the other things that they have to learn through school, it's my responsibility to help her grow and learn then I will take the time to get down on her level and walk her through, teach her, train her on what is to be learned. There's a big difference between a dad who's irritated, disconnected, doesn't care, just wants to get you off their back versus a father who cares. And I think we all want the father who cares, but we also secretly and probably less secretly than we think just want the solution. But if God gave... Abraham and Sarah, a child, right in that moment, the promise, the one that the Messiah would come through. If God did that, remember, they were still in the land of all those gods. They were still worshiping all those gods in a ungodly, twisted culture. They would have ruined the promise. They would have raised what was meant for God, meant for good, meant for one day the Savior to come through, they would have ruined that, and they would have brought that person up in a very sin-ridden environment. It is only by the grace of God that he didn't give them a child right when they wanted a child. 
Here's the promise, and bam, there's the child. Most of us, that's how we treat God. God, where is it? You promised healing, where is it? Financial blessing, I don't see it. Peace, I don't feel it. We see these promises in the word of God, or maybe we have a direct word from God, and we go, God, where is it? And sometimes, most of the time, I would imagine God's going, but you have a journey you need to go on. You have to walk with me. You have to take a leap of faith. You have to be willing to leave behind the things that are weighing you down, that are distracting you. You have to leave Ur of the Chaldeas, and you have to go to the promised land. And you have to go through that entire journey to get there. I think some of us right now, if we feel like, man, we've just been waiting. Where is God? Has he forgotten me? Why is he delayed? I think some of us, if the only takeaway we have from this service is I need to actually go back, hit my knees and say, God, thank you for being a good father that walks with me and trains me and guides me and changes my character. Remember, a father that doesn't care just takes care of it, but the one that loves you walks with you every step of the way so that when the blessing is given, you actually have the ability to receive it as a blessing. If Abraham and Sarah would have received Isaac, it would not have been a blessing. What should have been a blessing would have become a curse in their life, and they would have been deeply let down. But if they just waited and went through the process, God is a God of the process, 25 years later, Abraham was 100, Sarah was 90. They received not only the promise, but it was an actual blessing in their lives. I am so thankful that God has not given me the things that I wanted in the exact timing that I wanted them. I know if he would have given them to me, I would have messed it up. I would have messed it up, I would have hurt other people, and I would have hurt my family. And I would have slowed down the progress of God in my life. Trusting in God and his timing is not a get out of free jail card where you just go, okay, it's whatever God's going to do, God's going to do. No, he required Abraham and Sarah to pack it all up and to hit the road. And I think for some of us, we got to realize it's not just God's going to do what God's going to do. We trust him with the time, the provision, and the way it's going to happen, but we are always called to partner with God. In the middle of their journey, Genesis chapter 17, verse 15 through 16. God speaking to Abraham about Sarah. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, now bear in mind, before this scripture, her name was not Sarah, her name was Sarai. As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Can you imagine God speaking that over your wife or your spouse? That I will bless her. Nations will come from her. Kings of people shall come from her. But first, her name had to be changed from Sarai to Sarah. Sarai, many of you know this, it means princess. So God was changing her from princess, but there's actually another meaning for her name. Princess sounds good and sweet. The other meaning for her name was an argumentative or contemptuous person. (laughs) So in other words, on Facebook, you put princess, right? (laughs) But the person you married is the argumentative and contemptuous person. Can you imagine that road trip? 25 years with an argumentative and contemptuous wife? Oh my goodness. I'm sure Abraham was a pill too. But nonetheless, and so with that being the reality, and bear in mind, words are, names are far more important in the Bible than they are now. Like we name somebody because we think it's cool or it's trending, but back then that actually spoke to their nature, to their future, to their character. It was prophetic, words spoken over who they would actually be. So that being someone that's argumentative or contemptuous was not just a name. It was truly who she was. But here's the thing. Regardless of whatever argument she had with Abraham, her argument wasn't with him. Her argument was an internal one with God that was full of disappointment at times, fear, doubt, and jealousy. Here is a woman for 25 years being promised over and over and over again, you're going to bear a child. Every year getting older, 
every year getting further and further away from the land that she knew and she loved. We read in different portions of scripture where she legitimately argued with God, where there was hurt and anger in her heart and where she had been let down. You know, the interesting thing is, is we, we see this through the lens of the promise. The promise is you will conceive and you will give birth to a child. And so often we're one track minded. God, this is what I prayed for. I'm waiting to receive it. God, you promised a baby. Where is it? And there's nothing wrong with looking at it that way, whether it be for healing or for financial blessing or, or whatever the case may be, relationships to be restored. There's nothing wrong with seeing the end result of the thing that you asked for. But the real, the real blessing wasn't just Isaac. In fact, the word conceive, one of the definitions is not just conceive as in you're with child, but the word conceive means to apprehend by reason or imagination. In other words, to wrap your mind around a lofty idea, a big concept, a dream, using your imagination to see what does not yet exist and is not materialized in front of you. And so God had to change the name from an argumentative, contemptuous woman to now Sarah, which meant mother of nations. God changed her name because she was in an argumentative conversation over those years with God. Her fight was internal with God over the letdowns and the disappointments, unmet expectations. God had to prophetically change her name and say, you are no longer someone that's argumentative and contemptuous, but you are the mother of nations. And that's what we need to do over the giants that we face, over the situations that are in our lives. We have got to stop just copy, paste, repeat, magnifying what's already there, repeating back to God the reality. This is what's actually happening. Letting people know how messed up and how much abuse you've had and how much you've been rejected. Now, there's nothing wrong with being transparent and asking for help and, and seeking out wise counsel, but I don't think that's our default, that in and of itself. I think we lean too much into shouting out the, the broken name of our lives, the contemptuous, the argumentative side of us, and not the prophetic side of what God has called over us. And so whatever that situation is, finances, for example, you know, my, my family and I, we're, we're going to be facing down financial decisions that need to be made because of the car accident and, and looking at what that, you know, what the insurance is going to give us and what's available. And, and these aren't things that we wanted to deal with. There's a busy schedule. I didn't want to have to deal with this right now. I loved my car. It was a great car. Right now I'm driving and I'm thankful for the person that let me borrow it, but I'm driving a Prius. That's like insult to injury right there. But for my finances, I am tempted to be t terrified about this, to be concerned because we, we try to be very wise with our finances and invest and, and we, we avoid debt at all costs as a family and, and, and we make decisions to be good stewards of our finances. We tithe, we honor God with our finances, we give. I'm tempted to feel very nervous and to be, ah, what are we going to do and be looking at all the car websites right now trying to, trying to find the way, trying to present to God, by the way, here's the opportunity, this is how I need it. But before I do any of that kind of stuff, I have to settle in my heart that because I'm a follower of Jesus and because I honor him with my, with the tithe, the first 10% of my finances, that he promised that the devourer would be, would be rebuked off of my finances. Or in other words, the Sarai is, dude, you just broke your car, you smashed it, and you're going to have to spend a lot of money. The Sarah of my situation is, is I am not broke, I am blessed, and I will receive a blessing on the other side of this that will make my head spin because of how good God is. My finances are covered in the name of Jesus. Some of us need to change the very name of the circumstance in our lives and not call it Sarai, but call it Sarah. Amen? It was more than a name change. 
It was an identity change. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 and 6. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. I love that. Every single argument, idea, opinion, whisper, lie, deception that comes from the enemy, everything that comes to you, you have to call it out as what it is, is deception. I'm going to denounce it, and I'm going to bring it under captivity to obey Jesus Christ. I will be obedient in all that I think, in all that I say, and by faith, just like Sarah did, by faith, I will change the name of that circumstance, and I will submit it to God, and I will see the promise. We have to let God win the internal battles and our arguments. The arguments that we have with him, we have to get to the point where God, you are God, and you will win. If it takes 25 years, if it takes my entire lifetime, if I don't even see it until I get to heaven, I don't care. God, I believe that it is mine, and I walk in it, and I trust in you. God has to win the argument, the battlefield of our minds. My pastor, Lee Cummings, puts it this way. Supernatural promises of God are always after an invitation for you and I to step into the realm of the improbable and implausible. I'll say that again. Supernatural promises, the kind of thing that we want to see in our lives. Because if it's just natural and low level and it can be done by you or I in our own ability, then what glory does God get? What praise is there? How does that lift anybody up? We want the supernatural blessings of God, but that always comes after an invitation from God for us to step into the realm of the improbable and the implausible. Can you imagine Sarah, 90 years old, giving birth? No one around her would go, well, that's just because they love each other. <laughs> the power must have went out, right? Right? It wasn't that. That was a miracle. Everyone in that entire region heard about that, knew about that, because it was a miracle of God. And so when they asked about it, it wasn't one of our thousands of gods that we worship, worship from Uro Chaldees. No, it is the one true living God. If it's not a miracle, if it doesn't require the supernatural intervention of God, then you're not thinking big enough. The reason why we don't have to live by faith as American Christians is because things are pretty good. We can wake up, we have our social safety nets, we have the things in place, and we can live pretty okay lives with or without the blessing of God. We have got to get to the point where we again find ourselves, maybe for some of you for the first time, where you, there is no way this is going to happen without God intervening. There's no way that you are going to be able to pull out of this if it's not for God's grace and mercy. Some of you need to think bigger for your marriages and for your finances, your children, your health. You need to pray differently for your job. You need to pray differently for your church, for the calling that God that has that's, that's over your life. You need to live differently for the relationships. You need to be thinking about the miraculous and the impossible because that's how our God operates. If you want copy-paste vanilla, live like the rest of the world. Stay in Earl Chaldees. Stay there. But if you want literally generations to be blessed because of you and because of God and your faithfulness to him, if you want to see the course of mankind change because you partnered with God, then do exactly that. Otherwise, you're just settling for far less. A Pastor, Lee, Pastor Lee says it this way, that it, it's, it's pragmatic uh, life of emptiness. When you live trying to justify everything away, trying to live just within the safety boundaries of the road that you're on, trying to do things that are, are just maybe a little bit faith requiring, but not a lot, you're very pragmatic in the way that you see it, you're going to get exactly what you live for a life of emptiness. But if you want the fullness of God, the fullness of what he has called over you, the future that he has laid out before you, you have to take steps into the great unknown and trust God every moment along that path. A year before 
Sarah gives birth to Isaac, God visits, visits Abraham again with three visitors. Genesis chapter 18, verse 10. Then one of them said, I, surely, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent, which was behind him. So she was sneaking around. Verse 11. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. And so Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Stop right there. This is after the thousand mile journey. This is at the tail end of the 25 years that we know. We know that because we read the Bible. They didn't have that. They didn't know if they were at the end of the journey, the beginning, the middle. They just knew that it's been a thousand plus miles, 25 years, and I still don't have a kid. And guess what? Clock's a ticking. I'm getting older. Verse 13. Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I'm old? So basically she gets called out. Verse 14. God says this, is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. Just a kind of a general rule, a little fun factoid suggestion. When God is there and calls you out for laughing, don't lie. Be like, I didn't laugh. He knows, okay? He knows exactly what you did. I didn't laugh. Actually, you did, okay? It's a tent. It's not soundproof walls, not brick building. You are behind a tent. <laughs> You're not that stealthy. I love that, though. She laughed. That was still... And you know what I like about that? Is she's real. Along your faith journey, you are going to have moments where you are shining bright, where you're just knocking it out of the park, and you're going to have times where you are stumbling and you're on the ground and you feel like, you're, you're just like Sarah, laughing. Like, there's no way. I've given so much. I've prayed. I tried. I can't tell you the amount of times I've heard that as a pastor from people. I know. I tried that. I was kind. I was nice. I did pray. I did prep fast. I did worship. I, you know what? There's no expiration date on our obedience. Nowhere in the Bible do you, do you read that we should be God, have godly character for three months until it doesn't seem like it works. Or we should pray unless it kind of seems like it, it's not worth it anymore. All along the way, we are called without an expiration date to continue to pursue God. What I love about this story in Sarah is even though she was doing that, there's moments of doubt and disbelief. And that's encouraging to me because I have those moments too and so do you. Oh, in other words, you haven't missed the mark. The whole 1,000-mile journey in 25 years is not all thrown out the window because you have some bad moments. It will require you to humble yourself, to get back on track, to believe in God once again. But don't give up. Don't have the, I've already tried that mentality and it didn't work. Head down, power through, trust like you've never trusted before, submit your heart like you've never done before, and you will see the promise of God played out in your life. You know, when Isaac was born, his name, again, has purpose, has meaning. Remember, Sarah laughed at the very idea of having a kid. A year later, Isaac is born. The word Isaac means he will laugh. <laughs> Tell me God does not have a sense of humor. <laughs> Fine, Sarah, you're going to laugh? Gotcha. I'm going to name your son, he will laugh. God's always going to have the last laugh. He's always going to turn around. When we, give to, when we give to God nothing but, you can't do this, it's messed up, here's the deficiency, this is why it's not going to work. When we just project back to God all of the brokenness and all of the things that are not lining up, God laughs at that because he knows that right then, and for you right now, God is moving heaven and earth. He is transforming the world around you, whether you see it or feel it or not. And he is someone that will not be mocked. What he has started, he will finish. You will see it. You know, earlier verses talk about 
that uh, they didn't fully see it. And it might seem like I just contradicted myself. No. Abraham and Sarah, they didn't see the multitudes. They didn't see us now. We're a part of that. Spiritually, they have. They're in heaven. They see this. They understand. Their eyes are fully open. They didn't fully see it. They just saw their kids and their grandkids and a few generations after that. And so all I say is this. Don't lose hope. You may not, what you experience may not be exactly what you think it's going to be. It may not come in the timing or the package or the way that you were anticipating. But God will deliver every time. And it will be better than what you could have done. Most of us, if we heard back in Earl Chaldees that we were going to have a kid, we would have gone and done everything we could to have that kid right then, right there. But God says, no, in that scenario, but maybe in yours too, I need to take you on a 25-year, 1,000-plus-mile journey. Change the details and the stats all you want, but we are on a lifelong journey that will not end until you take your last breath here on this earth. Then and only then will you have completely finished the journey that God has called you to. If we are to please God, we are to be a people of faith. Let's stand up together. God, you said to Abraham and to Sarah, you said, is there anything too difficult, too hard for the Lord? And Lord, that's what we stand on right now. We recognize as the God that spun this universe into existence, the one that created every living being, including us, Lord, that who are we to call into question your timing and your ability and your intent? God, I thank you that time and time again, if our eyes are open, we have seen in our own lives that you have never left us and you have never forsaken us. We stand on that promise. We stand on that reality. God, I thank you that you have given us yourself, the Holy Spirit, to lead and to guide us. Abraham and Sarah didn't even have that, but we have that now as New Testament, New Covenant believers to be able to hear the voice, a still small voice, of you, God, and to respond accordingly. Lord, we ask that you help us to see what we cannot see, to trust maybe for the first time in you in brand new ways, to believe for the miraculous, to see you move in our lives and in this generation in ways that we could never imagine on our own. Lord, help us to conceive, to bring into our lives uh, the ability to see what is unseen to believe for what we cannot experience right now and to know that you will make manifest to us, known to us, that which you are already working in the heavenly realms. Lord, help us to believe in you in a greater way. Forgive us for the times that we have either stayed back in the land of our comfort, in the land that we know and we we cherish and not move on that journey. Forgive us for those moments. Lord, forgive us if we stopped in Heron and, and just rested and said, okay, I don't know where I'm at on this journey, but I'm just taking a break. I'm done. I'm tired. Lord, forgive us. Help us to identify where we are at so that we can get back on the trail and continue to move forward. God, we love you. We want to be known as a people of faith, not just people that are in a journey, but people that are experiencing the faith promises every single day so that when they see our good works, when they see the blessings, when they see the miracles, we can point them to you. You will receive all of the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen.